Welcome everyone. My name is Bridget Zapita. I am the Training and Education Manager for Heidelberg Engineering. I'd like to welcome you to the first of our 2024 webinar series, Glaucoma and Spectralis SDOCT, Diagnosis, Masqueraders, and Clinical Pearls, presented by my former colleague, Dr. Patik Amin. Dr. Amin is an optometrist and an assistant professor in the Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences at the University of Chicago, where he also serves as the Director of Optometry. He earned his optometric degree from the University of Houston and completed a residency in ocular disease at the Albuquerque VA Medical Center. Dr. Amin's clinical practice focuses on the medical management of glaucoma patients. He has a strong interest in education and founded the first optometric residency program at the University of Chicago in 2021, for which he serves as the program director. He is a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry, serves on the executive committee for the Academy's glaucoma section, and is a member of the Optometric Glaucoma Society. All right, so I'm really excited for this presentation. Um, I'd like you to uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Amin. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks, Bridget, for the kind introduction, and thank you to Heidelberg for hosting this webinar. I think uh, the topic is especially fitting given that it's uh, Glaucoma Awareness Month. So I'd like to spend this lecture and the next hour reviewing commonly utilized scan protocols and reports for glaucoma diagnosis, including the importance of using macular scans. I want to highlight ocular conditions that can masquerade as glaucoma and uh, discuss the clinical utility and common pitfalls that come with OCT usage. A little bit about my practice here at UChicago. So I primarily manage patients that are either being evaluated for glaucoma or have a diagnosis of glaucoma. Being a large clinic, we have several OCT, OCTA machines from different vendors. However, my preference for glaucoma evaluations uh, is utilizing the Spectralis platform. And, and for a couple of reasons, one is it does a great job of providing transparency um, of the raw data that's being utilized to generate the reports. Uh, it uses uh, key landmarks, to ensure that the scans are anatomically centered and and uses that baseline for follow-ups. And I think that's really important that uh, you have confidence that when you take a scan six, 12, 18 months from now that uh, the data you're seeing is uh, directly uh, tied to the baseline scan uh, you performed. And it does a really good job of generating uh, various macular maps that we'll discuss today. As we all know, glaucoma is one of the leading uh, causes of vision loss worldwide just behind uh, cataracts. Um, but unlike cataracts, you know, it leads to irreversible vision loss. And we know that about 50% of individuals with true glaucoma are walking around undiagnosed. And glaucoma, you know, defined as a, as a chronically progressive and irreversible optic neuropathy that's characterized by degeneration of the retinal ganglion cells and resulting structural changes to the optic nerve head. When we look at this continuum down here, you know, we start with asymptomatic disease. Uh, where you have changes at the cellular level, which are undetectable, uh, which then cascade to retinal nerve fiber layer uh, changes, uh, changes that are visible on clinical examination, uh, and that eventually builds up to lead to functional impairment and or uh, blindness. And so our key is to catch glaucoma as early in this continuum as possible. And technologies have certainly increased our sensitivity to pick up glaucoma earlier. Um, it's estimated that we can lose up to 30 to 45% of our structure before we have functional loss. So it's essential that we don't wait for repeatable visual field defects that correlate with structural findings before we make a diagnosis. Um, the take home message here is that a diagnosis of glaucoma can and should be made when there's adequate evidence of structural loss, uh, even if there isn't a corresponding visual field defect yet. In terms of the clinical examination, right, we take a patient's history, we look at uh, risk factors, uh, but then we move on to our clinical examination and, and optic nerve head evaluation is, is crucial in, in a diagnosis or evaluation of glaucoma. And it's important to actively uh, observe the op optic nerve and uh, have a checklist of what we want to look through. Um, so the five major aspects start with uh, look, uh, evaluating the optic disc size. Is it a small, average or large disc, um, evaluating the neuroretinal rim, is it well perfused, is there pallor, does it follow the isn't rule, are there changes to the neuroretinal rim such as notching, 
Um, then we want to evaluate the RNFL, right? Either if they're on a red free, look at the infrared image of our OCT scan and look for uh, obvious defects. You know, we often see wedge defects on um, clinical cases. Uh, those look impressive because there's usually an associated visual field defect. But the most common type of RNFL loss in, in glaucoma is actually diffuse. Uh, we also want to evaluate the peripapillary uh, area for atrophy. Uh, in patients that have glaucoma, there's often an inverse relationship between loss of neuroretinal rim and an increase in the beta zone peripapillary atrophy. And then we also want to look for the presence of disc hemorrhages. Now, in terms of, uh, in terms of the disc size, it's important that we get a, a feel of if the disc is average, uh, large, or small, because that gives us uh, some parameters of what what sort of expected CD ratio or cup to disc ratio that should be, um, uh, that, that would be considered normal. And uh, once you see enough nerves, you kind of have an idea whether the nerve you're evaluating is larger or smaller, but uh, in terms of assigning a numer numerical value, we can do that behind the slit lamp using a, a thin optic section, you know, with a nice sharp focus on the, on the blood vessels, um, and then measure it with your vertical height tool. Uh, but you can imagine that that would be um, limiting in terms of efficiency in a busy practice. Also, patients aren't always uh, the best fixators. Uh, media issues like cataracts can also um, you know, create haze and, and create a um, difficulty in terms of creating it. But if we do get a measurement, you also have to keep in mind that um, you know, there are conversion factors based on the magnification of your lens. A uh, 60 doctor lens is a one-to-one -one ratio. Uh, and 78 adapter lens is a 1.1, and then a 90 adapter lens is a 1.3 conversion uh, factor. Um, so here's a case that highlights the importance of disc size. Um, so this is a 68-year-old African-American female that was referred to us uh, for an evaluation. Uh, she was deemed a glaucoma suspect due to large uh, up to disc ratios. Uh, she had a family history on her uh, maternal side. Uh, Goldmine IOPs were symmetric and normal. There were no signs of secondary open angle glaucoma. Uh, gonioscopy was open and unremarkable. Uh, the dilated optic nerve head evaluation revealed 0.7 cup to disc ratios in both eyes, both with normal rim configurations so and no focal changes, no disc hemorrhage. Um, and the nerves appear to be larger. So remember, we have this um, sort of illustration that. Um, gives us an idea of what an expected normal CD ratio would be. Uh, and we talked about measuring behind the slit lamp, but another way I kind of um, measure uh, and utilize the spectrals to measure disc size is by using the measurement tool. Um, and so you can see that we use the calipers here and uh, the disc is about 2.6 millimeters in the right eye and a vertical disc diameter of uh, 2.4 in the left eye. So much larger than the average disc, which is right around 1.8. And so our assessment here was a larger than average cup to disc ratio with normal rim configuration and a larger than average disc size. Uh, no definitive signs of glaucoma. Uh, the RNFL measurements, which are not shown here, were robust and, and normal in both. Ways. A little bit further about uh, discussion about disc, disc size. So, you know, there, there have been studies that have looked at inter-observer variability or, um, or lack of agreement and all have come to the same conclusion that there's a lot of variability and subjectivity when we grade and um, uh, determine cupped disc ratios. There's also a lot of um, uh, issues with how the, how the disc, disc size influences our perception of whether a nerve is glaucomatous or not. And so um, there was a study done at an optometric meeting uh, where they um, asked the participants uh, to look at two sets of three stereoscopic disc photos. So um, three large nerves, one, uh, sorry, three glaucomatous nerves, one small, one medium, and one large, and three normal nerves, uh, same thing, one small nerve, one average nerve, and one large nerve. About 261 attendees uh, participated, uh, and these were stereoscopic disc photos. And what they found was that optic disc size had a statistically significant influence on the accuracy of glaucoma identification. Uh, they found that two thirds of the subjects identified large normal nerves as glaucomatous. And more concerningly, 91% of the subjects 
identified small glaucoma nerves as, uh, as normal. And so we have some variability in judging cup to disc ratio. Um, we also have uh, a propens propensity to overdiagnose large nerves and, and miss the small nerves. And so given the technology that we have available to us now, it's important to integrate OCT into the glaucoma assessment, which is combined with our clinical examination, but also the patient's history and, and functional testing. And so um, the Spectralis offers a few of those things. One is the BMO uh, minimum rim width and the RNFL. The other is the posterior pole asymmetry analysis, and the last is the hood report. And over the course of the next uh, 45 minutes, we'll kind of discuss those in more uh, detail. So in terms of any sort of RNFL measurements, a uh, quality baseline scan is important, right? Because we're, we're tying all of our follow-up scans to that baseline. And in circle, like circumpapillary scans, uh, in, in most uh, instruments, uh, not just the spectralis, we're asking the imager to manually uh, center the scan on the optic nerve. And so that introduces some subjectivity. Um, and so it was, it was great when they introduced uh, anatomically positioned scans because they utilize landmarks that are unique to the individual, uh, the Brooks membrane opening at the center of that, and the fovea to establish a geometrically accurate measurement uh, of the neuroretinal rim. And this is important because there is a lot of variability in where the fovea lies. And so the range of angles for the fovea to the center of the BMO axis is large across the population. It can vary up to 35 degrees between individuals uh, or even between eyes. And so anatomically correct scans um, can increase the precision and accuracy of these results. And so here is a um, here's an illustration from Reich et al. where they um, did a circle scan um, and you know, appreciate that the fovea is way off, uh, and that results in a shift in the in the superior or the inferior peak, and that causes a, an abnormal flag in the temporal. However, when that optic disc fovea angle is corrected, now this individual has uh, normal RFL measurements throughout uh, their optic nerve. Um, and so again, these anatomically correct uh, scans um, allow us to uh, individualize the scans to that person's configuration of axons, and this increases the accuracy when we're comparing these individuals to the reference database. Now, Gabriel et al. looked at the location of OCT scans and how they affect RNFL thickness measurements. And they found uh, a couple of things. They found that when the scan circle was displayed horizontally, the peak values didn't change, but the peaks were either nasally shifted um, or temporally shifted uh, based on which um, side was overcorrected. And then vertical displacements uh, didn't change the peak location, but they changed the peak um, values. So the inferior and superior article thicknesses uh, changed. And so here's an example uh, of a patient that I saw. This is a 54-year-old Caucasian female that presented for a baseline glaucoma evaluation. Uh, her mother has glaucoma. Her Goldman IOPs in clinic at that visit were 24 in each eye. Uh, pachymetry was thicker than average in both eyes. Uh, no signs of secondary opening of glaucoma. Gonioscopy was open and unremarkable. Uh, and the dilated optic nerve head evaluation revealed you know, average symmetric CD ratios in both eyes with normal rim configuration, uh, no notching or disc hemorrhage present. And so we talked to her about the risks um, uh, and benefits behind uh, monitoring versus treatment and the OAT study. Um, and we also obtained the uh, RNFL measurement uh, for a baseline scan. And so this is the baseline scan and you can appreciate that there is um, a flag inferred temporally in this left eye. And, you know, by glancing at it, um, that's concerning. That's an area that's affected in glaucoma. But if we look closer, we can see that um, the fovea to optic disc angle is, is incorrect, right? So, and this is causing a shift in this uh, inferior uh, peak or inferior bundle, and then causing a, a confounding the, the measurements that are displayed. And so, if we go back and we obtained a 
uh, APS centered um, or BMO centered RNFL scan. You can appreciate that now um, the values are uh, more um, within normal limits as expected. And so even if we center the scan uh, and we use uh, BMO RNFL where we, we're using the anatomical positioning system, um, that still doesn't mean that there can't be other ocular pathology uh, or scanning errors or artifacts that can confound what the results are. And so Liu et al. looked at 200, uh, 2,300 scans. They found that 46% of the time, these scans had at least one artifact. And then they cataloged those, um, uh, those uh, different artifacts. So we're going to go through some of those. And so this first example is, you know, this patient has a vitreopapillary traction uh, resulting in a, you know, incorrectly segmented ILM and incorrectly segmented RNFL. And, you know, I think one of the positives of the Spectros platform is that you can actually go back and, and correct these algorithm errors. Uh, but a word of caution on, on conditions that might change or evolve over time, um, especially in, in areas where it's, it's not always 100% um, you know, reliable to discern where those um, segmentation lines should be. You can adjust it, but you're going to have to adjust um, these segmentation lines every time you do a follow-up, and there, there introduces some subjectivity there, and then you're not going to get the same exact location every time. So while it's, it might be important to um, correct the segmentation lines to get an evaluation of what the neurofiber looks like, you have to keep in mind that's probably not a great utility for long-term uh, follow-up. Here's another example where there's a failure here of the RNFL segmentation line. Uh, pointed out by the yellow arrow. Uh, this is a little bit easier uh, to correct, and uh, you can either rescan this individual or correct it, and uh, most likely it's not going to be a repeatable sort of defect. Here's an example where this failure to completely segment borders of the retinal nerve fiber layer and the ILM, uh, probably due to poor imaging quality. Um, and then here's another example uh, they had of just poor scan signal, and, and as Spectralis defines it, that's a quality of less than 15. Uh, the total quality score can be out of 40. And so the issue with artifacts, and if they go unnoticed, uh, we're not critical when we're evaluating the B-scans uh, to ensure that they're correctly segmented, is that then that leads to red disease and green disease, right? So green disease and red disease um, cause misinterpretations uh, of, of the data that's, that's present. And so red disease is a false positive, right? It involves a scan that looks bad, but actually is not. Um, this can happen with patients with high myopia, uh, with peripatillary atrophy. Uh, it can also be just results of simple segmentation. So this is a, uh, a slide where we see uh, inferior temporal uh, flag on the RNFL measurements. Uh, it's corroborated by the circumpapillary T-SNP curve. Um, so that looks like glaucoma, but if you look closely at the B scan, you can see that there's a failure right here. If we go back and correct that, this patient now has normal appearing optic nerves. And, and actually, uh, there's a smaller um, sort of artifact here that wasn't corrected that corresponds with this small blip superior temporal. Green disease is far more dangerous because it results in a false negative. Right? We're missing a patient that has glaucoma because we're relying on the, on the color schema. So in this patient, green looks good, right? I mean, both eyes look robust, 100 in the right eye and 107 in the left eye. And the first clue should be that there's a seven micron difference between the eyes. And so it should prompt you to look a little bit closer. And while the B scans look great, um, you can appreciate that there is a focal dip inferior temporally here in the, um, uh, in, on the T-SNP curve. And, so sure enough, if we go ahead and obtain a visual field on this patient, this patient has a superior arcuate-like defect involving one of the four central points right there. So let's talk a little bit about the macula. You know, I think traditionally it was taught that the macular region was spared until later stages of glaucoma. And this idea was supposed by the fact that there was, you know, largely preserved central visual acuity until end-stage disease and visual field testing that, you know, where the defects were more peripheral and then kind of worked their way in. And 
the mantra was always 24s, 24s, until you can't do 24s and then switch to 10-2s. Uh, but there's a lot of contraindications to this model. Uh, there's been a, a, a plethora of evidence that's kind of come out over the last uh, decade that indicates that there's both structural and functional macular involvement throughout the spe spectrum of glaucoma. And that starts with some visual dysfunction evidence that you know there's uh, identified blue yellow color vision defects early in the glaucoma disc process which likely represents macular ganglion dysfunction this visual adaptation changes to contrast loss of contrast sensitivity in glaucoma even in the earliest forms and studies have found that there's isolated central visual field loss um, and it's common in early glaucoma particularly when you start running 10-2s earlier a lot of this work in the, in the macular region and central visual fields has been spearheaded by Donald Hood and his group out of Columbia. They've done a tremendous amount of work over the last decade to increase the, uh, the general sort of um, uh, awareness that you know, we need to pay attention to the macula more. And here's a great example of that. Uh, in this 24-2, you know, relatively benign loss on first glance, but if you look at the actual GB, you know, it's about a two-thirds reduction in that. Uh, superior central point right here. And sure enough, when we run a 10-2, uh, there is a fixation splitting superior uh, defect on, on central visual field evaluation. And there's also structural evidence uh, along with visual dysfunction evidence. Uh, many studies have shown that partial or inner thickness parameters carry similar diagnostic capability to RNFL thickness measurements. However, full thickness macular parameters have generally underperformed compared to RNFL, uh, the exception being macular thickness asymmetry. Um, and so macular thickness asymmetry um, was evaluated by Sullivan, me, et al. Uh, back uh, about a decade ago, and they uh, utilized the posterior pole asymmetry analysis um, and com compared inter-eye and intra-eye macular thickness parameters and their diagnostic capability compared to RNFL. And they found very similar rates of di diagnostic precision with inter-eye asymmetry between the two eyes as compared to just global RNFL thickness. And so what is the posterior pole asymmetry scan? So this is a scan that involves 61 B scans in a uh, grid-like pattern. Um, and that's then um, each individual volume block. There's 64 volume blocks that are generated on an eight by eight grid. Each volume block is assigned a, a macular thickness value. And then those are summed to create a superior, an inferior, and a total macular thickness um, um, number. And then these graphs then display inter and intra eye symmetry, uh, and we can compare those. And what they found was that if there was a, uh, Sullivan Me et al found that if there was at least a greater than four micron difference between the eyes or greater than eight micron difference intra eyes, so between the superior and inferior hemispheres, that should increase your suspicion of glaucoma. And so let's look at some posterior pole uh, scans. So this is a patient on the infrared image. You can appreciate there's a nice, um, a wedge uh, RNFL defect that shows up nicely in this arcuate pattern on the asymmetry analysis. And the macular output map also shows that this area is, is thin. Here's another example, again, a very uh, visible uh, wedge RNFL defect inferiorly. Um, you can see the corresponding asymmetry with the inferior uh, retina is more thin or macular is more thin. And then the macular output map also shows uh, that area now, just like, like the RNFL scans, there are things that can confound these uh, total thickness map scans or posterior pole scan. And one is vessel distribution in um, So you can see here that uh, this grid is um, asymmetrically sampling more of the superior vessel bundle uh, than the inferior vessel distribution. And so that's leading to some of this asymmetry. And so we can't then apply these thresholds of you know, greater than eight intra I. And so just like the RNFLs, we have to pay attention to uh, macular maps and make sure they're not confounded by pathology or just decentration or, in this case, vessel distribution. 
So here's a case uh, that kind of highlights the importance of, of macular maps. Um, so, you know, the current parameters that are utilized are a clinical exam, RNFL measurement, uh, LCT RNFL, and a visual field, right? So in this individual, the op optic nerve head assessment shows some changes, maybe superior temporally, but nothing definitive, no obvious notching of any kind. Uh, the spectralis RNFL shows that while there's some noise here, there's a superior temporal loss. Um, and then on the visual field, there is a inferior arcuate uh, sort of loss that corresponds with the superior temporal RNFL. And so with these three uh, parameters, while our clinical assessment of the optic nerve may be inconclusive, there's definite structure function correlation between the optic nerve and visual field involving a region that's most commonly affected uh, of the nerve in glaucoma and producing a glaucoma-like arcuate defect. Well, let's add some more information. So if we added a posterior full asymmetry scan, you can appreciate that there's marked asymmetry, the superior part of the retina is very thin. And if we ran a B scan through that, you can appreciate that it's not just loss of our belt, there's loss of a lot of the inner retinal layers. And here's a comparative example that's going to illustrate the importance of this topic as well. So these are uh, two visual fields, you know, both with moderate field loss, uh, superior sort of arcuate defects with paracentral central involvement. Uh, we also have the respective T-SNIC curves, which you can appreciate the focal notch in the inferior temporal sector. And if I, uh, you know, told you that the fundi looked relatively normal outside of a focal change in the optic nerve that corresponded with OCT, and then I told you that one patient had BRAO and the other had primary opening of glaucoma. You can see the challenge that even with the traditional clinical parameters, that you can't confidently call one POAG and one BRAO. And so we saw this index case back in 2012. Uh, this was a middle aged Caucasian female that presented for a routine follow up in 2012. And you can appreciate that the optic nerve head was unremarkable. Uh, this is a picture in 2013. You can appreciate embolus in the inferior branch um, of the artery. You can appreciate the retinal whitening um, that's present. And the FA illustrates delay in um, a delayed filling that we typically see in such occlusions. This is the patient's visual field um, prior to the BRAO. This is the patient's visual field following uh, the BRAO. This is the patient's uh, pre-event RNFL measurements, normal. And this is the patient's um, uh, RNFL measurement about one year later. And you can actually see uh, the changes to the different sectors over time that kind of stabilize right about six months uh, post-event. This is the patient's asymmetry scan. Um, that was uh, taken prior to the BRAO, and you can appreciate symmetric intra and intra-eye values. And this is the patient's uh, post-BRAO scan with really marked asymmetry, a lot of thinning in that area. So what's going on? Well, the differences in OCT macular features in a retinal artery occlusion and glaucoma can be explained by the retinal anatomy, right? So the retinal arterial system is divided into the superficial and intermediate, intermediate and deep capillary plexi. And the superficial plexus, you know, services the ganglion cell layer and the fiber layer, while the intermediate and deep capillary plexus, a plexi serve the inner nuclear layer and the outer plexiform. In the setting of a retinal artery occlusion, both plexi are affected. And so there's atrophy, market thinning, and loss of normal stratification of the inner two thirds of the retina. Uh, the pathogenesis of glaucoma, as we know, is distinctly di different and is characterized by degeneration of the retinal ganglion cells and the nerve fibers, the axons. And so we see uh, thinning just localized to the nerve fiber layer and the ganglion cell layers. But the rest of the retinal nerve, uh, retinal fibers are, uh, retinal layers are unaffected. So this is the patient's RNFL pre-BRAO and then post-BRAO. So you can appreciate the market thinning, the loss of stratification of the inner two thirds of the retina. Um, so in summary, acutely, you know, BRA causes retinal thickening and edema and vision loss that's spatially correlated with the location of the fluid arterial. 
uh, and that stabilizes that law stabilizes over 12 months. Uh, but in the in the chronic phase, several months post BLAO, uh, the fundus and uh, forcing and geography can appear normal, and that's because there can be recanalization of that once secluded arterial. And often a BRA goes unnoticed, right? If patients can be asymptomatic, if there's spared central vision, uh, they may not even know they had a BRAO. And if we see them much later on um, and the fundi look relatively normal, uh, there's subtle to no signs of an inclusive event. Um, so the OCT plays an important factor there. So if we go back to our case that I showed you, and we look at patient A and B, again, with traditional sort of parameters and, and evaluating tools, uh, it's hard to discern the two, but if we add a posterior pole um, scan, and so macular thickness output map, you can appreciate that while both have loss inferiorly, patient A has a lot more loss. And if we run a B scan through that, you can appreciate that patient A has uh, loss of more than just the RNFL, there's market thinning and loss of stratification, whereas patient B has just loss of just the RNFL. And so um, the patient A has BRAO and the patient B has primary open angle glaucoma. And so this was the interest of mine. And so in residency, we evaluated um, and we evaluated a group of patients that, that uh, um, suffered BRAO, compared them to early primary open angle glaucoma patients and normal patients. And we compared the volume of blocks, right? So there's 64 individual thickness value blocks and so we calculated those and we found that uh, there was a significant difference. Um, all the BRAOIs exhibited these three contiguous blocks where the, uh, the thickness was less than 200 microns. And because these very thin blocks are coded in black on the macular output map, uh, this, can, this can be quickly visualized um, you know, by brief inspection of the map during clinic. You know, we don't always have time to scan through all of the B scans, but if you look at the macular output map and you see uh, a few contiguous blocks that are shaded or coated in black, and that should warrant further investigation and maybe um, evaluating those B scans in that area. More importantly, we also found that uh, an intra eye, so uh, a, a difference between the two hemispheres within the eye of greater than 25 microns, was highly specific and highly sensitive uh, for uh, differentiating BRAO. Uh, the area under the curve was, was 0.9. And so, in summary, BRAOs uh, exhibit profound intra-eye macular thickness asymmetry, cause prominent inner retinal atrophy and loss of stratification, and present with multiple volume blocks, usually coated in black, that are very, very thin. Um, so let's talk about a few cases I've seen in clinic that masquerade as glaucoma or are confounded by other concurrent disease. And so this first case is a 77-year-old African-American female was presented for a glaucoma evaluation. Uh, she was vasculopathic, but also had a diagnosis of lupus. Uh, her ocular history was, was significant for cataract surgery in the past. Uh, no family history of glaucoma. At her visit uh, at our clinic, her IOPs were 21 in the right eye and 27 in the left eye via Goldman. Her chart review of her medical records uh, from the prior practice, her untreated TMAX was 22 in each eye. There were no signs of secondary open angle glaucoma. Gonioscopy was open and unremarkable. And on dilated optic nerve head evaluation, uh, the right eye had a 0.6 cup to disc ratio with normal rim configuration. And the left eye had a 0.65 cup to disc ratio with um, an area that would appear to be thin inferior temporally. And so this is the patient's uh, RNFL measurements. And so you can appreciate uh, flag superior temporally in this right eye and the flag superior temporally and inferior temporally that are all outside normal limits. Um, and so what happens if we also obtain a macular thickness map? So the right eye displays fairly good symmetry. So there's not any significant intra-eye symmetry in the right eye. Uh, there is inter-eye symmetry. The left eye is more thin by at least eight microns. Uh, and then within the left eye, you can appreciate your eye should gravitate to these multiple blocks where there's um, very, very thin retina. And so this should prompt us to look at a B scan. And so in this B scan of the left eye, through this area that's marked as very thin, you can appreciate that there's a scalloped appearance of the RNFL, of the, of the middle RNFL. 
And so what is that? So there was a, a study um, published back um, in 2013 by Sarah Fagal that first identified this, uh, and it's termed uh, paracentral acute middle maculopathy. And it's characterized by this acute infarct um, that's present as a hyperreflective band spanning the inner nuclear layer, which typically evolves into inner nuclear layer atrophy. And so you can appreciate that in this, um, in this example from the study author, this looks very similar to our facial ski scan. And so they've identified two types of uh, paracentral acute middle maculopathy. Type one is the one that we see in our example patient, um, where there is a, a level of involvement between the OPL and INL junction, and that leads to the scalloped appearance long-term um, and atrophy of the INL. Type two is uh, an infarct between the OPL and ONL junction, uh, which leads to atrophy of the outer nuclear layer. And here's another um, um, example that this, the author published where you can appreciate, again, this hyperreflective band in the initial acute phase, and then four months later, there's this classic scalp um, appearance. Another case we saw was a 68-year-old Caucasian female that was referred by our retina team uh, for larger CD ratios that looked suspicious for glaucoma. Her medical history was uh, more remarkable for re relapsing, remitting uh, multiple sclerosis, which was diagnosed 18 years ago following an episode uh, where the patient describes marked vision loss and eye pain in the right eye. Uh, she's been on Avonex uh, since the diagnosis, uh, reports minimal re uh, relapse since. Um, so again, ocular history pertinent for optic neuritis in 2005, um, no family history of glaucoma, Goldman IOPs were 13 in each eye, uh, no signs of secondary open angle uh, glaucomas, um, gonioscopy was open and remarkable. And the dilated optic nerve head evaluation revealed a 0.7 cup disc ratio in both eyes and a slightly larger than average disc. Um, and this was how it was presented to me when um, uh, my resident came to talk to me about this case. And so we reviewed the RNFL scan and what stood out to me here was that there was loss temporally in both eyes, which is not very common in, in glaucoma, but it's common in non-glaucoma optic atrophy. And there was loss, obviously, in the superior and inferior uh, temporal poles in the right eye as well. Um, and so I went and took a look, and you know, I feel like when we're evaluating eyes that have significant amounts of optic atrophy and there's loss of, of complete color, the chalky, those are very easy to pick up. Uh, when there's subtle changes to uh, the near retinal rim perfusion and there's focal changes, a focal pallor, that can be a little bit more difficult to discern. And so this person, this individual did have temporal pallor more in the right eye than the left eye. Uh, we also looked at the posterior pole asymmetry analysis and you can appreciate that generally the right eye is more thin than the left eye. Uh, within the right eye, there's um, um, more thinning inferiorly than there is superiorly. Um, and the GCL map kind of shows the same, is that there's kind of this generalized loss in the right eye uh, present as well. And so this patient, patient's diagnosis was confounded by optic atrophy resulting from her MS. And so we referred her to neuro-ophthalmology. Uh, she likely has concurrent, potentially concurrent glaucoma as well that we'll monitor. But um, uh, again, another case where there's um, another disease confounding our, our glaucoma evaluation. This third um, case that we'll talk about is a 67-year-old African-American female that presented to established care. She was diagnosed with glaucoma and on two medications. Um, the diagnosis occurred 10 years prior. Uh, so she was on latanoprost every night and timolol every morning. She was um, vasculopathic as well as uh, having obstructive sleep apnea and GERD. On examination, uh, Goldman IOP revealed uh, pressures of 15 in each eye uh, on the two medications. The chemistry was very thin in both eyes and no signs of secondary opening with glaucoma. Gonioscopy was open and remarkable. In the optic nerve head evaluation, uh, the right eye uh, had a 0.75 cup to disc ratio with a thin superior rim and mild pallor in that same area. The left eye had a 0.65 cup to disc ratio with a normal rim configuration. And so we obtained a spectralis RNFL here, and you can appreciate the, the market difference in, in, the, in the thickness values. And so the right eye has profound loss of the RNFL kind of globally, um, 
with some inferior temporal area that's, that's kind of intact. The left eye appears to be all green. Um, and so we obtained a posterior pole asymmetry analysis. And again, uh, we can see the, the market difference, right? Greater than 25 microns. We have multiple blocks of, of um, multiple blocks of very thin retina that's coated as black. And so again, our mind should gravitate towards running a B scan through that area. And uh, sure enough, when you run a B scan, you can appreciate um, in, in, through the superior temporal retina, you can appreciate that the uh, inner, inner two thirds of the retina is very thin, there's loss of stratification. So this patient had an occult BRAO in the past. Now, if you look at that, you might say, well, okay, this patient has, this patient has a branch retinal artery occlusion, they don't have glaucoma, uh, we should take them off drops. But we talked about green disease earlier. And so if you look more closely at this left eye, uh, there's actually a focal dip um, here, superior temporally in the, on the T-SNIT. And there is corresponding asymmetry. There's loss in an arcuate pat uh, pattern of the superior, uh, superior part aspect of the macula. And so this, the patient likely has concurrent uh, disease, um, concurrent glaucoma. Now, glaucoma is a change over time, right? So we have a baseline, we'll monitor the patient over time and see if there's further change. Uh, but again, another scenario where uh, a non-glaucoma entity is confounding our measurements and also an example of green disease. So we're gonna focus the rest of the, our, our time uh, on the macula. And you might remember the slide from earlier where Again, the 24-2 the appears to be relatively benign. If you look closely, more closely at the, uh, the deviation, you can see that the sensitivity of the superior temporal central point, superior nasal uh, central point is a two thirds reduced. So we run a 10-2 and you can see this fixation splitting superior arcuate. And the question always is, when do you know how, when do you know to run a 10-2, right? So we only have limited time in our clinics. Uh, we can't run multiple visual fields on one visit. Uh, we have trouble scheduling just our 24-2s. Um, how can you, do you wanna sacrifice a 24-2 scan uh, to do a 10-2 visual field? Um, uh, we were at OGS last year and we were talking about the number of visual field tests it takes to detect progression. and so. If you conduct one 24-2, which is the typical pattern, right? You see a patient every six months, you dilate them, you run a visual field in earlier stages of glaucoma. It can take up to six years to detect change. And so now if you're saying, I'm also gonna swap out one of those with a 10-2, that's probably not the best practice pattern. So can we use the macula as a, um, as a risk profile? Can we use macula, uh, macular scans to identify which patients might need a 10 2 sooner. I've trained uh, my eyes, I've seen this so much, and I'm more aware of that. That, uh, you know, I'll take a look at this point and I'll run a 10 2, but our trainees uh, will gloss it over um, and uh, not recognize uh, the profound loss that, that's occurring there. And so, Donald Hood's group uh, published um, a paper recently about um, in 2022, and uh, they've talked about the macular vulnerability zone for a while, but what they propose is that. We know that the superior temporal and inferior temporal poles of the optic nerve are the most susceptible in glaucoma disease. But what they found is that the superior temporal uh, fibers um, actually serve a lot of the retina outside of the macula versus the inferior temporal um, uh, RNFL serves more of the area that's within the macula. And so this is the more vulnerable macular region and this projects to the inferior quadrant of the macula and um, in inferior region of, of the, the macula. And so the posterior pole asymmetry analysis is great when we have um, loss, uh, you know, uh, arcuate pattern sort of loss, but it doesn't really do a good job of telling us, hey, this person might have central visual field loss. And just like the example we talked about earlier, I want to remind you that it can be confounded by things like vessel distribution and symmetry. And so the Hood Report kind of helps us um, look at uh, the GCL and RNFL uh, in, a, in a different, uh, a different, um, a different pattern. And so I want to review this Hood Report that's available on the Spectralis. Um, the probability 
uh, maps uh, are not available in the U.S. Uh, but you know, looking at this uh, printout here, we we have the B scan image like we do on the original output. We have the circumpapillary or NFL thickness um, serving sort of in, in a pattern. Instead of being T snip, it's actually they he's flipped it where the inferior temporal and superior temporal poles are in the middle of your view. Right? These are the areas we're paying attention to. So his sort of idea is why I put them on the edge when that's what you want to pay attention to. You don't really want to look at the nasal RNFL, so let's shift them over. Um, he then has RNFL thickness um, based on the cube scan of the 61B scans. Um, he has a GCL thickness on his maps. And then there's the two probability maps that are available in his exam example, as an example in his paper, but again, not available in the US. I think the, the interesting thing about this is that he's taken um, the RNFL thickness and GCL thickness maps, flipped them uh, to be functionally corresponding to a 24-2 overlay and a 10-2 overlay. Uh, and so then we can evaluate the GCL loss or RNFL loss and predict where the visual field defect might be. And I had a couple examples of patients I had seen where the hood report did a good job. And I was looking for the last couple of weeks to try to find that patient. Um, and last week I had a patient that came in that kind of exemplified why this, this um, hood report is a, a nice um, addition to our toolbox when diagnosing patients and identifying central visual field loss. Uh, so this was a patient I saw uh, just last week, a 64 year old African American female uh, she presented to establish uh, care with us. Uh, she was diagnosed um, with mild primary opening of glaucoma by an outside provider. For her pressures at the visit last week were 14 in each eye on latanoprost the monotherapy. Uh, per chart review, her untreated Tmax was 22 in each eye. Uh, pachymetry values revealed average corneal thickness um, um, in both eyes. There were no signs of secondary open angle uh, glaucoma. Uh, gonioscopy was open to scleral spur in both eyes, non-visually significant cataracts. And then the dilated optic nerve head evaluation revealed 0.6 cup to disc ratio in the right eye with the inferior and temporal superior rim were equal, so didn't follow his rule. And the left eye, uh, it was a 0.7 cup to disc ratio with an inferior temporal notch. Um, and her chart review reported a inferior temporal disc hemorrhage in 2020. We obtained a BMO RNFL, and you can appreciate that in the right eye, uh, no uh, flags, but in the left eye, inferior temporally um, is flagged outside normal limits. We're going to do a quick review of a B scan. There's no algorithm errors. Uh, there is a focal dip in the inferior temporal T center that corresponds with this. Uh, and then we ran a uh, posterior pole scan. And you can appreciate again, good symmetry, inter eye in the right eye. This inter eye asymmetry with the left eye is more thin in general. Uh, and then within the left eye, there's an inferior area of um, more thin retina that corresponds with our inferior temporal change in RNFL and optic nerve. This is the patient's uh, hood report. And so again, the same sort of output on the RNFL. Uh, we also have GCL loss here. This is the patient's 24 2. So again, she has um, this superior loss that's uh, involving one of the central four points. Um, and if we run a 10-2, this patient has you know, an incomplete superior defect within about three degrees of fixation, okay? Now, if we look at this loss and we look at the 10-2 points that are overlaid on the GCL, you can appreciate that the GCL is lost in the same area that this pattern is. And so this is a, a prime example of the Hood Report um, identifying a patient that uh, would have 10-2 loss. And so again, it's it's a great um, a great example of that. Uh, and uh, kind of concludes my 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 talk. And I want to kind of talk about a, a few summary points uh, and clinical pearls. Uh, one is that OCT is essential for the monitored management of glaucoma. The reports are only as good as the data, right? So if there's garbage in, there's garbage out. If there's confounded data in, 
we can't trust the reports. And so we want to evaluate the raw data to make sure that there isn't any segmentation errors or other artifacts that might influence or create um, unreliable reports. A diagnosis of glaucoma can and should be made when there's adequate evidence of structural loss, right, on your optic nerve head evaluation, on OCT scans, uh, on macular uh, posterior polysymmetry scans, even if there isn't detectable functional loss. We call this preparametric glaucoma. Supplement your RNFLs with macular scans, whether it's a posterior polysymmetry scan, a GCL thickness uh, report, or the hood report. And then watch out for early visual field loss uh, that's central. Look for a severe depression with superior two central points on the 24-2 uh, and examine your OCT scans closely. Uh, look for focal inferior temporal loss on the RNFL. Uh, look at the, uh, the field view on the hood report uh, to identify patients that would benefit from running 10-2s. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them now, but I also have my email that um, feel free to email me as well. All right, sounds great. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Amin. Juan, so good to see you again. Um, thank you for sharing all of your knowledge and expertise with our audience. Great to hear you teaching. Again, miss that. Um, at this time, we are going to take audience questions. Um, I have already received a few questions, so I'm just going to kind of roll here, Dr. Amin, um, and let's see what we've got. So first question, what is your approach in, in comparing OCT scans of the optic nerve head for progression of thinning? What is my approach? Um, so on the spectrolysis, I use the change report. I think okay. that was a really good job. I don't have an example of that, but does a really good job of identifying which areas have changed over time and smart as, you know, it'll show the different T-SNIC curves um, over time and then represent loss in red and any gains in, in, in green. Um, we're not expecting anyone to gain RNFL thickness. Um, so if we see a lot of green, that could indicate that there's a shift in the scan. Oftentimes that means there's, um, you're comparing um, scans that might be misaligned or there might be other things confounding but the change report does a good job of showing progression over time. Great. Um, can you explain your glaucoma protocol for return to clinic? For example, when you have your, your patient come in for their first clinical eye exam, what is your regimen for return to clinic and what are the first tests you perform? Do you perform any tests at the day of their um, first uh, clinical eye exam or do you have them come back for that? Yeah, so my normal protocol is, uh, you know, we obtain pachymetry, gonioscopy, dilate and get a posterior pole scan and, and the uh, BMO centered on a bell scan. And I utilize to that to evaluate the individual uh, to see if they have glaucoma. Now, you know, I think there are patients that definitely have glaucoma. You might not even need an RNFL scan to, to point that, uh, to recognize that. And their patients are definitely very healthy. Unfortunately, glaucoma, those things are not together, right? There's a lot of gray area. And so sometimes RNFL, the, the follow-up OCT scans are inconclusive. Or sometimes they're diagnostic. Um, but I, I typically do not, even if there's a diagnosis of glaucoma, if there's not a really high pressure or a, a concern for immediate treatment, I will bring them back and get another pressure reading before we start treatment. Uh, but again, on, on the baseline evaluation, I get an RNFL and posterior pole. And then for subsequent visits, I'll, I'll just get the RNFL measurement um, and obtain visual field testing. Okay. Um, and next question is, do you find the asymmetry map reliable in, in cases of significant peripapillary atrophy or when the RNFL is not helpful? Yeah, I think it depends. Um, um, you know, is it a patient that just has um, peripapillary atrophy around the optic nerve, or is it because they have MACD gen that's also extending into the peripapillary atrophy uh, area, a uh, peripapillary area? I think if it's just that the RNFL measurements are not super reliable, I do rely on the MAC thickness uh, or the posterior polysymmetry map in those patients if it's reliable. Um, you know, we know that um, myopic nerves are very difficult to assess and often RNFL measurements are not reliable. 
macular thickness value uh, maps are a little bit less confounded sometimes. And so if it's reliable, and again, there can be the same issue with posterior pole. So we want to make sure that the, the scan is reliable. I do sometimes lean on the posterior pole scan instead. Um, the other thing that I've noticed too is that with GMPE, we have those three different ring sizes, right? So if there is, you know, um, a confounding factor like PPA, sometimes if it's within that 3.5 zone, you can go out to the 4.1 or the 4.7 and see um, any, you can kind of monitor change from there as well, inclu including, you know, looking at the macular maps as well. So um, I find that GMPE for that is a little bit nicer as well for PPA involvement. I actually uh, was looking for an example case. Uh, I um, My sister-in-law was visiting and she had mentioned that her optometrist was concerned about glaucoma in Dallas. And um, we did the scan, but it was under like a test profile and they couldn't find it. But she has uh, PPA. And um, so the initial uh, circle, the three and a half millimeter circle is confounded. But if you go to this, the intermediate uh, um, uh, value, it shows that her article thickness is, is normal. So, um, yeah. yeah that's Great. Um, and let's see here. Is there, um, is the evaluation of the posterior pole and macular scan a part of your routine evaluation every single time, or is it only triggered by that at a normal RNFL evaluation? Uh, I obtain it on every single patient. So every single patient that comes in that I'm seeing for the first time, whether it's a new glaucoma eval or like a glaucoma suspect that's been, you know, uh, seen by other providers in clinic, uh, they all undergo both scans. Um, and I, I think it's not an either or scenario. I think it's, um, again, um, we want as many different evaluations of, of glaucoma that we can get and kind of put them together. So. I rely on, on both maps, uh, both scans um, for every patient that I evaluate. Um, this question um, is, uh, historically, IOP readings and corneal thickness measurements have affected the clinical eye exam. Are you finding yourself relying more now upon diagnostic testing than um, IOP and corneal thickness? Yeah, so, you know, IOP is not part of the definition of glaucoma, right? We, we know that Sometimes it is high, um, but I, I, while I get pachymetry readings on every patient, it's not to correct the IOP um, because uh, there's no universally accepted correction factor. Uh, we don't correct IOPs anymore. Uh, but just to get a sense of, like, are we severely over or underestimating the, the patient's IOP? And then specifically to patients that have ocular hypertension, which is you know, defined at least two visits, where with via Goldman the pressure is above 21, then pachymetry readings play um, play a role in staging the risk. Um, we know that patients that have high pressure uh, that have average corneal thickness, and that's defined uh, by the OAT study as being between 555 and 588, have about a 10% risk. But if their uh, their corneal thickness values are higher or greater than 588, it's less than that. If it's less than 555, uh, so they're thinner than average corneas, uh, the risk is actually greater. Okay. All right, so that looks like it's that's all we have for the question. So I just want to say thank you again. Um, and to our audience members, I'd like to invite you to the remaining sessions in our 2024 webinar series program. Um, we have some exciting topics planned surrounding new spectralist updates, just like we had Dr. Amin featured for GMPE. And we have some of the newest technologies in our portfolio going to be featured as well, including Anterion. Um, to be informed about any of our future webinars, please like us on Facebook and Instagram. You can also subscribe to our um, Heidelberg Engineering newsletter and locate additional educational materials on our business lounge. And that website would be www.he-lounge.com. Um, and for the rest of the audience members or anybody who registered for the webinar tonight, there will be a recording that is supplied to you um, at the conclusion of tonight's webinar. So thank you all again all for attending and we look forward to seeing you again. Thanks for your. Thanks.